right, so again, welcome. And, uh, and if you haven't already, please sign in. I see a lot of folks have, and thank you for doing that. It helps build those connections uh, outside of the meeting as well. Um, we've got a great time, a uh, great agenda today. And really our goal today is focused on the DigiCon, sharing that behind the scenes look at all the work and planning and lessons learned uh, that went into that uh, awesome event. And so our goal is to just is to reflect on the successes and lessons learned from that DigiCon to inform some future events, planning, whether it's with this group or with groups that you're a part of in other areas. Um, before we launch in, just a couple little housekeeping items to share. So uh, under our new and upcoming header, I'd like to share uh, a few things that might you might not be aware of or you might want to check out. So uh, we've got two conferences to feature today. Uh, the first one uh, is the UDL IRN Summit, so it's coming up, and the early bird rates are available now. So if you're interested, the link is there. Um, if you haven't been before, it's great and a great chance to meet some folks face-to-face -to -face too. So lots of people here have been and would be happy to share their experiences with it. Um, so that's one that you might be interested in. Um, another one is the UDL and Higher Education Unconference at Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario. And I know Darla's on the call with us today. Um, I wanna say hi, just a quick hi, Darla, if you're there. Hi, oh. quick hi, hi. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I will put a link to um, the conference webpage um, on in the chat. Okay, awesome. So it will be handy if that is helpful to folks. That would be great. Thank you, Darla. Will um, do. So it's at Mohawk College and it's totally focused on higher ed. So Allison Posey will be the keynote. We're so pumped. Like it's going to be about emotional learning. It's going to be, um, and it's an unconference, so it's directed by the participants there and totally focused on higher ed. So um, Allison's going to do a UDL 101 session in the afternoon. Eric and I are going to do kind of a 201. And Danny Smith, I haven't seen him on the call yet, uh, is going to do um, some teaching techniques for UDL in the classroom. So um, it's worth checking out as well. And Darla, uh, or Danny or I could answer any questions, but Darla is definitely the brains behind this operation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't so, know about that. I have an incredible steering committee. <laughs> if there's any things, Darla, if there's anything else with conferences, please add it in there so we can share and learn about some of the things that are happening in your neck of the woods. All right, so those are just a few kind of quick notes, and I'd like to turn it over to Eric for a couple minutes. Uh, to give us an overview of kind of the DigiCon origin story to set some context before we get to the panel. And then we'll introduce the panelists and we have a few questions uh, that were shared before um, from, the, from the Google form that we'll start with to kick us off and then we'll open the floor to questions from all of you. So if you have questions as you go, you, um, you can uh, add them as see when they're already, which is great, add them in the collaborative note. Uh, would be perfect so you can take a preview of that as well all right so over to you eric for some context thank you jody well so i just want to highlight the role that this group um, as a whole played in the existence of the digicon so if, if you um, have not picked up on it yet we had a meeting this time last year that was about the the uh, role of UDL on higher education in conferences past and future um, and one of the things that, that came up is just an idea that was floated was, you know, wouldn't it be so great if we had a digital conference that broke down the barriers of travel and expense and so on and so forth. And something that we've talked about a lot in this community is that there's no cavalry coming for us. You know, like, like if we want to see UD on higher education, it's us. Um, we're the early implementers. And so when we start saying things like, wouldn't it be nice if what we're really saying is, okay, so let's make a committee. Um, <laughs> and so that's essentially what we did is, is we, we started a committee to see if we could make that happen. Um, and, you know, a year later now we can say we did it. And I'm very, very proud of that fact and of this community for pulling together um, to make that happen. Um, and we not only did it, but I think it was a resounding success both qualitatively and in the, the data we collected otherwise, um, people have just said a lot of positive things of the work that we were able to do. Um, one of my, the favorite statistics that I have is that we had folks from 11 countries 
um, participate both as presenters and participants in that event, which is exactly what we wanted. There were lots of people. I feel like I try very hard to be well connected in our in our field. That's something I, I'm, I'm a big networker, but I saw lots and lots and lots of names I had never seen before. And that too was exactly what we wanted. We know that there are people who are doing this work that can't come to the conferences or for whatever reason, whether it's, it's logistics or cost or whatever. Um, and so we really wanted that to be that type of event and it was. Uh, we had about 320 people registered and a lot of those were actually groups. And so we're estimating that about 400 um, sets of eyes were, were on the conference at some point during the day and probably several more will view the content asynchronously after the fact. We had 40 people presenting uh, from around the globe again, and sometimes we literally had people from around the globe presenting in the exact same session, which is <laughs> really neat to see, um, and is really only possible in the format of a Digicom. Um, so today we're gonna kind of be, be listening and hearing from some of the folks who were, were part of that. Um, I can't stress enough how much it was a team effort. Um, like there was from, from conception to is this even possible to okay who's doing this the the entire process was deeply collaborative um, and that's I think was his primary strength if, if I could say one thing was the best part about it I think it was the way it pulled people together to bring their strengths to the table to make it happen um, <clears throat> please note that if our questions during this time go beyond the hour you can follow up with Digicon members uh, where uh, the panelists are listed down below and our contacts will be up top so you can we can answer questions another way. I want to briefly share my screen a moment here so I can show you a couple things. First of all I want to share with you the feedback that we got and I'm just extracting sort of the, the Google Forms summaries um, but you can see Going from, from good to very good to excellent, um, we have a, something like, I'm, my math isn't 100% of an English major, something around 90% <laughs> of folks you know, said it was at least good, if not very good or excellent, with almost half of the participants saying that it was really excellent. There was only one person that said it was very poor, I'd love to hear more from them, um, and three people of the 86 who responded that said it was fair. Um, and so in, in some capacity as well, it's worth recognizing that this format, while it was very helpful for a lot of people might not be the best format for some people and that's okay too um, so that's we can recognize that um, overall impression of the event mirrored that for the most part um, they liked the event and this was on a scale of one to ten would you recommend it to other colleagues and you can see it was skewed very heavily towards the top end of that scale uh, what drew you to the Digicon, if this is of interest to anybody? Of course, most people were interested in the topics. Um, the ticket price was impressive to a lot of folks at only $20, and a lot of people had colleagues presenting. That got skewed a little bit, but those were the top three. Um, and you can see about 97% of people who completed the survey said they would like more online events like this. And so that's really why we want to share out our lessons learned, because there's clearly a need uh, and a desire for more content like this that brings people to the table without barriers. And so um, we do want to share that out. I've collected in here, and you can kind of look through this in more detail anytime. I've shared it in email, and I'll put it in the chat as well. But I've summarized uh, different um, constructive feedback, things that people are suggesting would make it even better next time. The number one request was to schedule breaks into the schedule. Um, and so as it was, we basically were going session to session with literally no time between sessions. And so that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, we can, we can do that better by adding some time in, not just to give people time to transition and to think and to let their minds rest to gel a little bit, but also maybe building in some longer sessions for people to socialize and network like you would around the coffee bar at an at a in-person conference. We also had a lot of positive feedback. So the summary praise is down here. A lot of people said it was very relevant, very useful content. Um, of course, they liked the convenience of online and low cost. Those are the top two positive comments. So there's more there as well that I encourage you to look through. I also wanna briefly share though, again, encourage you to go through this a little bit further. This was our main asynchronous collaboration space for the committee as we were working together for over the course of about seven or eight months. Um, so the document, of course, did not always look the way it does now. This was an evolving Google document, um, but you can kind of see where, where we ended up. The most important element, I think, was the master to-do list on this page. Uh, and this, again, kind of 
we didn't know what we were doing or what, necessarily what we needed to do next until we got there. <laughs> um, so this sort of rolled out, but it was very important for us um, at certain times to meet and figure out, okay, what are we doing in this stage? How are we gonna define success by October or whatever, um, by January? I mapped that out and had and people just volunteered to said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And we communicated largely in here, oftentimes through conversations, some of which have been closed by now. Um, but so you can see we split it into three phases, essentially a the green phase, phase one was really the, the area in which we were trying to see, um, trying to get a feel for if, if this was going to work before we got too far down the road. And so we wanted to get sponsors, we wanted to develop some structural elements, um, you know, to see, um, do we have the, the people power to make this happen? And then that transitioned into now we're ready to go live and start broadcasting this is going to happen, you know, with the save the day, with the, the call for proposals, trying to get some secondary sponsorship and so forth. And finally, the third phase was actually, um, not finally, but the third phase was then developing the structure, the online structure, which ended up being Google Docs. And Anne can um, perhaps talk a little bit about the process of other things that we tried before getting there and then there was during the conference. So you can kind of see this this chart could be adapted and kind of gives other people what we didn't have to begin with, which is sort of a master overview of, of several things that have to be done. Um, and this probably could be populated in greater detail. Some things were just happening um, in conversations, but by and large, these are major things that, that had to get done and that did get done and that might be of use to some folks. All right, back to you, Jody. Switch my screen, awesome. Thanks, Eric, that's so helpful to get that kind of early context and to set us up for a panel discussion. So um, a big welcome to our panelists. So we have Eric, we have Mark Nichols. Uh, where are you? You wave there, right in the middle, thanks Mark. Uh, Adria from, yep, there we go. Uh, Kirsten is joining us. Um, I don't think she's here yet. She's gonna be a little bit late today. And uh, there she is, awesome. Welcome Anne and Eric. So um, we'll, we'll start off with um, kind of a round table with our panelists for them to introduce themselves. And uh, our opening question is uh, here. Oh, whoops. Um, what's your, in one minute or less, or about one minute, you can, that's an ish. <laughs> Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about you and your role in the Digicon planning team and what your biggest takeaway or lesson learned is from the Digicon. And it's a bit of a free-for-all, so you guys can fight over who gets to go first. <laughs> well, I'll jump in. Thanks, Anne. Um, Anne Og, UNC Asheville. Um, and I guess I'm also responding to Eric's comment about the... Uh, the difficulty we had with finding a platform for this. Um, I had volunteered to use Open Journal Systems, which has an open systems um, conference software. But uh, once we dove into it, we realized that it, or actually, uh, I want to thank Eric for pointing out that, you know, it really wasn't, uh, it had a very dated look. It didn't have, I think, some of the features that um, we were looking for. Um, and so we abandoned it, but uh, I think along the lessons learned along that was um, uh, really having deadlines in place when you're collaborating with someone so that uh, it doesn't just end up in kind of uh, the um, stratosphere where, because everybody's busy. Um, and so, uh, and I also, I made a note on that document, I certainly, forgot that it wasn't a working document last year's planning, because that was such a phenomenal way to keep everybody abreast of what was going on. But um, to find some way of, uh, or purchasing maybe with our funds, a, um, uh, some software that can handle the, the yeoman's work of what you all did at the last minute, which was linking all those sessions from that Google Doc, which I thought was incredible. And I, I'd love to hear more about how that process took place. Um, I think the other thing I worked on was um, the advertising. We put together a flyer, and again, it was all done collaboratively. So um, it's important to lose any sense of ownership on this. Um, and uh, I was also a um, proposal reviewer, and I certainly enjoyed that. I thought it was fun to see what 
folks were thinking about submitting to the conference. And I, let's see. Um, and then finally, uh, I attended the conference and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I thought there was a, a, just a great wide range of um, sessions and, um, and I can't wait to, to help get this cranked up again next year. I, you know, I am shocked, Eric, when you said that it was just last year that we were talking about doing this. And that I remember thinking, okay, so we're saying this is gonna happen in, um, I think November was the original. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it, but it, yay, kudos to you all. It was really a pleasure to be a part of it. So uh, that's what I've, I've got to add. That's awesome. Thanks, Anne. It's uh, that collaboration part and losing that sense of like building that shared ownership stands out to me as a real achievement of what the folks did to put this together. For sure. Awesome. Uh, um, Adrian, do you want to go next? Sure, as I slowly unmute my, <laughs> like, where is Thank the button? You. I'm someone that needs more training, I think. <laughs> um, so I had a very small role uh, in this process. I, um, I'm, I, I'm Adria, I'm at University of Texas at Austin. This community has been instrumental to my own professional development around UDL, as well as my ability to serve my campus. Um, and this conference just, reinforce that from from being able to observe the planning to the actual execution and implementation of it was just for me really inspiring and reaffirming um, that people can practice what they preach so that was a big takeaway for me is is always fine-tuning and learning um, pd and workshops and presentations and utilizing udl um, my role in this was working on the call for papers um, recruiting reviewers, um, leading one of the strands for the reviews and reviewing myself, and then uh, attending the, the conference presentation. Um, and there was something else I was going to add about, um, what, was our, what was our main question, Julie? A takeaway? A primary takeaway? I think um, that's right. Yep, a takeaway or a lesson learned. Um, yeah, so I, wow, I think probably a, a takeaway is just the impressive amount of leadership that we have in our early implementers, um, both in form of the, the team that put this together, but also, also all the folks that were presenting. Um, I'm a worker bee, like I, I'm somebody that's like, oh, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I appreciated the opportunity to um, kind of plug in in a way that made sense to me, even in the planning process. Um, so that was really great, and and yeah, I think that's my my big takeaway is just that I love this community. So I'll get on my cheerleader soapbox if you let me go on too long. So pass it on to someone else. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Perfect. Well, we'll pass it over uh, to Mark. And uh, Mark, what was your role and some lessons learned from you or key sure. takeaways? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Nichols from Virginia Tech. Um, I also had a really small role in the production of this. Um, it was primarily the, uh, the technical aspects of it um, from the uh, Zoom management um, and the assignment of the Zoom rooms. And, and uh, I think uh, my, my biggest takeaway in this was um, I'm terrible at technical back end and attendance at a conference because as much as I wanted to attend the sessions I found myself being drawn back into the technical management on the back end and being the liaison between our team that was doing some of the technical aspects behind the scenes um, and troubleshooting some of the live and learn lessons of utilizing the Zoom platform in the manner that we utilized it which was fairly new for Virginia Tech um, as far as doing something on that scale with that many people that are not VT folks with needing to have uh, sessions recorded um, and then be able to be uh, transcribed at the end with a third party vendor company, so with Verbit. So my, uh, my role was definitely just kind of the technical side of it. I really enjoyed the pieces that I participated in in the sessions um, and look forward to watching the videos, but um, we definitely had some live and learn lessons with on this scale and this magnitude of having multiple Zoom rooms and some, some gotchas that we hadn't, known about prior and probably a live and learn lesson would have been to conduct even more testing than what we did prior to uh, uh, to this event. So that's kind of my summer. Yeah, I can only imagine that the technical support 
balancing with the tendon would be would be a, a challenge to say the least. <laughs> awesome. And how about over to you, Eric? Your role and some kind of alluded to it earlier, but some uh, lessons learned from you. Sure. Well, um, yeah, as others have said that the, the team aspect was was huge. Um, you know, it's sort of cliche that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something, you know, but that was sort of the, the mindset that drove what we were doing. You can see on, on that table, um, you know, all the, the different things people signed up for. And then there was a lot more people involved than just the core committee as well. Um, and that was that was huge. Um, not only because it, it relieved the pressure of any one person having to do anything or make decisions, um, but it also meant when it came to the um, to recruiting people to come to the event, there were a lot more people who had a stake in the game, you know, who who wanted people to come to it for that reason. I think that was a huge reason for the, the turnout. Um, a second thing to, to me, though, is um, the value of sponsorship. And, you know, I was a little bit shy about asking for sponsors at first. You know, I didn't I didn't think why would anybody really want to sponsor this little up and coming first time ever sort of Digicon. Um, but people were really very willing. Mark was the first one to put me in, in touch with Verbit um, and they took on they were going to do the post event caption. And I mentioned that I would like some live captioning or live transcription. Like, oh yeah, we can do that too. By the way, do you need a logo? And hey, we can build a website for you if you want. You know? <laughs> and they just like kept offering more and more stuff. We didn't take up, take them up on everything, you know, but, um, as, as we were kind of late in the game at that point. But it was a good lesson for me to learn that these these sponsors, um, oftentimes they want to sponsor. It's, it's sort of a win-win situation. We obviously get that support from them, but they got a lot of, free advertisement from us as well. Um, and so I think that they want to be involved in that. And so why not? Um, and so that that was a big one. And I think, you know, Mark, I, I really do want to sing the praises of Mark and his team. That was a lot of work um, to pull together the, the Zoom meetings and all of that. And he was doing a lot of that the last minute. Um, and they did a remarkable job that, you know, the, the technology all day, I think was very smooth. Um, that said, I, I think I don't, wouldn't necessarily want to put that on an institution next time, especially if this might potentially grow. So it occurred to me, why not ask Zoom to sponsor? <laughs> you know, we're giving Zoom a lot of free advertising by hosting this event, and they could have an unlimited number of rooms of any size with all of their features. Um, and so that's something that, that I'll definitely start with next time. So if you're looking to, to potentially have an event like this, I would just say make a team, get as many people involved as, as you can. Um, and not only people who are in the in the field, but people who could potentially sponsor. Um, it's just really as beneficial for everybody involved, the more people um, get in there. Awesome. That team theme is loud and clear. And the, um, yeah, I, the technical part too is just so impressive to me. So uh, to Mark and your team, that's uh, an impressive accomplishment as well. Um, all right, so let's go into uh, our first question from our, um, from our Google Doc form. And our first question I have it highlighted in the shared notes and I'll put it in the chat as well. But this is the first question. And so it's to all the panelists, so please jump in uh, with your perspective on the response or you can share the responses, however it works best for you. So the question is, what challenges did you encounter making this platform work? What recommendations do you have if others would use a similar model? So some of those came out in the lessons learned, but if there's more you'd like to add to that, please do. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, I think only because the, uh, I think the, hmm, the call for proposals, um, you know, using a shared Google Doc might not have been the most seamless way. Um, so uh, I think that was a challenge. Um, as I said before, the the whole conference software didn't work, and I would love to see us invest in something that uh, you know whether it's you know there's a lot of them out there, and we could certainly explore them. But um, the uh, although the shared Google Doc for this the, with the session links did work um, surprisingly well. I mean I. Um, so I, I, I don't want to fault any of that, but uh, I just think it, would, it must have taken a huge amount of work at the last minute. I, and I'd love to hear one of you share how that all got pulled together, because to be honest, I was absolutely shocked at the amount of work when I um, first logged into the, the, that shared Google Doc. So I think um, 
let's see, and recommendations. Um, gosh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I honestly, Eric, I, I can't imagine um, how you live a personal life, to be honest, um, after, <laughs> after all the work I saw that you had done. And then in the meanwhile, I think you were building a family, which um, is it, just remarkable to me. Um, I can barely get the dogs fed. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear about, uh, you know, how you made all of that work. So I'm just going to go ahead and mute and listen. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, I have a fantastic wife, you know, who backs me up and everything. So that's, that's the first part. It's all about the team. <laughs> um, but I also need to say Mackenzie was a huge part of those Google Docs. That wasn't, that wasn't all me. Mackenzie Nicholas um, was, was sort of the um, at least a co-brain child and, and creator of those documents. Uh, for, for creating the schedule, we really began uh, with the premise that we had those strands and, and, and we figured people would want to follow strands potentially, like I, you know, UDL starting out or UDL and professional development, depending on one's job title. And so even though there was going to be, you know, the recording, the asynchronous, we wanted to give people an experience of being able to go through a strand all day or, or, or at least not overlap. So they have to choose between two presentations that are on the same strand if we could help it. So we started, so there was that element. Then there was the element of people saying when they were available because we were calling people from all over the world and so forth. Um, unlike an in-person conference, we couldn't know for sure that people were available all day. And so they, they had to tell us what times they were available. So we looked at those two, um, and basically it was easiest for me to, as, as old school as this is, to print it out and kind of create a grid and move things around, you know, with color coding um, to try to get it figured out and then put it back into a table in Google Docs. Um, and then from there, uh, Mackenzie took it and dressed it up a little bit and, and um, came up with the idea of having a page for each session that we could link to. And that gave us tremendous flexibility um, to build from there. Uh, one, one point of feedback we did get about that is that some folks found it a little bit confusing about when the start and end times were in that, in that document. So that's something we'd have to figure out better for next time. Uh, but does that answer your question a little bit, Anne? Yeah, and I think the important part is that that piece would it would be there regardless of what platform we used. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. The Google Docs. One thing I really liked about it is how flexible it was, uh, so that we could make changes right up to the moment that the Digicon was starting. You know, we we kept coming up with new ideas of what we wanted to put in there and how we wanted to modify it, and the fact that. Mackenzie and I could both be working on it at the same time, for example, you know, just gave tremendous flexibility. Um, that, so that was, Verbit did offer to make a website that I'm sure would have looked very beautiful, um, but we wouldn't have had nearly that flexibility. And so at, especially at the, um, at the time that that was coming together, it didn't make sense for us. Um, but that is definitely a strength of that medium. Excellent. And, uh, Mark or Adria, anything to add to that question? A head shake. Mark, how about you? Sure, just one thing from the technical standpoint, because I know that especially those that are partic had participated um, uh, in the uh, conference, uh, you may have noticed some issues with microphones not being muted. And that was honestly driving me um, up a wall trying to figure out because we had initially preset all of the sessions um, to have muted mics upon entry. Um, and just about halfway through it, we recognized the fact that, um, again, leading to sufficient testing prior on any platform prior to releasing it for an event, that we had people that um, logged into sessions sometimes hours before the session, and that assigned a, um, a presenter role. And then when our staff went in and readjusted to the new presenter, that somehow wiped the default setting for muting of all microphones. So some sessions worked great. And other sessions, if you had people that hopped in too early, overrode those settings. And so then we had some microphone issues. And so um, I think that was a live and learn lesson for us of how we were utilizing Zoom, um, utilizing Zoom rooms specifically, um, and that there are other aspects of Zoom that perhaps could be leveraged. And suggestion by Eric is probably the best one of 
having an official sponsor by Zoom to do that. But that's why it was, I, I received lots of emails like, hey, you guys can structure the, the meeting so that there's muted on entry. And I'm like, I know we did that. I can't figure out why it's not working. <laughs> so that was a, just a live and learn for us. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the, get it going. We had this set up. <laughs> Microphones behave. All right, awesome. So that's a little bit about uh, the platform and some recommendations and very helpful. Um, and so let's turn now to the next question. Um, and this is looking at kind of the design and development of the sessions and focusing on a little bit more of the delivery and the sessions. So this question asks, could you please provide examples of strengths and opportunities for growth in your design and development of the ses sessions in the DigiCon? So I'm gonna throw that in the chat as well, because I'm pulling these from the, um, from the shared doc here. And open floor to our panelists, who would like to get us started uh, with their perspectives on this question. I would say there was um, one point of feedback we got is that there was some repetition uh, among different presenters, especially in the getting started with UDL thread, you know, there's uh, a lot of folks sort of approach getting started with UDL in the same way. And so if you went to multiple sessions like that, um, then you really heard the same thing or, or shades of the same thing multiple times. And so there might be opportunity to, um, to clarify in the CFP, um, don't cover this territory. Like we can have a, in a UDL 101 asynchronous that goes out before the conference. And so if you're going to be talking about getting started with, with UDL, um, it's, it's not really a boilerplate get started with UDL. It should be something more, more specific to a context or a situation, something like that, I think would really go a long way to, to preventing that sort of repetitiousness. Hi, all. This is Kirsten Beeling. I um, joined late. I'm so sorry. I was one of the reviewers um, and a happy participant in the conference itself. Um, from my perspective, one of the things that I was looking for um, is sort of thinking about UDL, again, as Eric said, sort of taking it to the next level um, beyond just the um, sort of intro level. And although there was some great resources, a, a couple of folks did some really nice work on different types of technology that we might consider using and new ideas. But um, as a reviewer for the UDL non-classroom um, sort of strand, I would have liked to have seen more um, ideas in that space. Uh, so for how can we support students outside of the classroom, whether that's in learning strategies when they're doing their, you know, assignments in the evening or commuting. Um, to and from, which is something that, you know, um, I know Tom and I have worked on before. Um, so sort of thinking a little bit more globally about that. And I think part of the, the strategy just to, to support that is to maybe reframe what we were looking for in the call for, for, for proposals. Um, just as with any sort of first step for UDL, it's less about sort of saying, are you doing UDL versus tell me about what you're doing and let me, you know, sort of teach you that you are actually doing UDL in that capacity. So I think just reframing that that idea would be helpful and I bet we can get some really wonderful and fruitful um, conversations in that space. Well, I would also add that the first time in anything, I think it was a bit risky for scholars to step up and, and uh, offer um, proposals. So I would imagine that next year we'll, we'll see a, um, hopefully a greater influx of those proposals. Awesome, and um, Adria, did you want to jump in? No, no pressure, but don't want to leave you out. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, anything else from the panelists on that on that question? All right, on to the next one. This one I am intrigued with as well. So uh, this question is kind of about what best practices uh, did you take away from the conference? So this question reads, I would like to see a document of best practices for a conference that perhaps the entire UDL IRN could suggest to other conferences. It could be for digital or face-to-face -face conferences or training. So think of that a document of best kind of UDL practices for conference planning. So what practices from 
your experience would be on that list. And I put the question in the chat again. So what practices would be on that list? I'm just going to jump in here. Um, I just got back from the pod conference, which I know some other folks here were also at. And I think one of the things um, I'm always stealing from Tom and Eric and Julie. So I'm stealing again here um, from Tom at our last conference that we just came back from. He said, less is more. And Tom, you can elaborate on that. But I, I think that that's um, a really good practice. And I saw some of the sessions modeled that and really allowed people the space to think about what they what the presenters were talking about and to do and to have conversation and some other sessions still um, just because it's culturally ingrained in conference presentations to have a lot of material um, so we saw some we saw some of the sessions modeling that old style and a lot of sessions in part because I think of the great resource that the um, committee put together about tips for presenters and even in the, the call for proposals, you had to be really specific about how you were gonna model UDL um, practices and strategies and, and a framework in your presentation. So that helped a lot. And there's always room for growth there, I think too. So um, I'm stealing from lots of people's ideas and, and labor there, but I would say that's a great practice that could use more um, expanding upon and, and training for folks. I would agree with that. I, and, and as you're, you're talking about that modeling, Adria, I think that that's such an important concept uh, for the conference as a whole. We tried very hard to, to, um, to think about barriers and to design to address those barriers, modeling UDL and the design and delivery of the presentation, for example, through the provision of, um, of, of materials both synchronously and asynchronously with the, the captioning and the um, live transcribing and so forth. Even so, there there were limitations that, that I would highlight. Um, first, uh, live transcribing is not the same thing as live captioning. And I feel like somewhere along the way, that communication got garbled. Like I, I, I was expecting live captioning, and it turned out the, that this, the vendor did not actually have capability to live caption at the time. They could live, create live transcripts. And what we were hearing from some participants um, was that they found it difficult to access the transcript while in a session because they were in a digital device or because they didn't have two monitors, et cetera, which makes perfect sense. They were actually asking people in Google Slides to turn on the caption, the auto captions in Google Slides rather than go to a professional live transcript. Um, so that's something that I would, I would underscore that it's really important to to model accessibility, to model UDL and the design delivery. And I think we did to an extent, but we, we still will do better next time. And one way that we could have done better this past time and that I would do next time is make sure that we're asking people um, of, of, uh, with disabilities or whatever, um, the people that were explicitly, that we know explicitly need certain accommodations, modifications, or accessibility provisions, and ask them how we can best do that. They will often know the best way to, to approach that and can inform us. Um, so we wouldn't have to wait until we did it wrong the first time. You know, um, So that's, that's a good note from my perspective. And since Adria summoned the demonic voice that is me, uh, this is Tom Tobin. Hi, everybody. Uh, one of the, the challenges that I face, I put on conferences for a living now, and one of the big challenges that I face is everybody, and Eric, you talked about this a couple seconds ago, but everybody wants to give an introductory level presentation. And it is a challenge to find people who are working not at the beginner level, but at the practitioner and approaching expert level on the topics and subjects. So. One of the things that uh, we do is we try to beat the bushes uh, over at the Distance Teaching and Learning Conference, at the Educause Conference, at the OLC Conference. We try to go out there and find people whom we will invite specifically to give those higher level or more in-depth kinds of sessions. And uh, to the idea of give less, even if it's just giving one specific takeaway that's really narrow, but is still nuanced and deeper, um, that can really increase the 
satisfaction and, and practical takeaways that people get out of a conference experience. And also don't be afraid uh, in the call for proposals, if you get a, a session proposal that looks really good on an introductory topic, reach back out to those folks and say, could you level this up a little bit and, uh, and give people the option not only to have you know the 15 here's what udl is all about sessions but maybe the two or three here are some advanced level techniques for those of you who have taken the first steps so i'll, I'll echo a few things that other people have said awesome thanks tom great idea to um that reach back too that there's potential there at, with some of the folks who might be submitting that entry level and a reach back to help them because sometimes I think like you said Adria like we're not sure if less is really more <laughs> and reaching back and be like no less is more getting permission to to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I, I would just add one, one last point to the modeling accessibility um, you know we were focused on on the environment and so forth but there was also um, there were also some accessibility flaws in, in individual presentations. And so I think we could have done more to coach the people or, or to set you know, expectations ahead of time or even have an opportunity to review your content before it goes live to get that feedback and correction. Um, that's something I think I would do next time as well. I love that idea, Eric. That's really cool. Yeah. Me too. And I can see that being a really valuable, like that feedback loop and that support throughout the process being a really valuable UDL informed practice for conferences generally. In terms of um, sort of thinking about the more advanced user or um, adopter of UDL, I wonder if it might be helpful to sort of reach out to those who attended the conference this year um, and sort of say, you know, what did you learn from last year? Um, have an informal chat with them and see what they've implemented as a result of attending this conference and then encourage them to share their work and their experiences moving forward um, to sort of increase the, the um, the bowl of perspective speakers and actually ask somebody who came to the conference, learned something, maybe implemented it, and then to share their experiences, both good and bad, with how that went. Oh, I think that's such a very cool idea. I'm just trying to capture in the notes here too, but reaching back and using the folks who um, are in the community too and attended, that's awesome. Sounds like a regular blog post that could be fun. And I think Kirsten's gonna be the first contributor. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. <laughs> it sounds like there's some good things happening. <laughs> Fabulous. Other things to add to this list. What practices would be on your list for kind of UDL best practices for a conference, whether it's a UDL conference or otherwise? What else might you put on that list? All right. I asked that to try and give myself a chance to finish the sentence because typing and talking isn't my strength. So that was my journalistic filler. <laughs> um, if uh, we can return to that too, or if folks have suggestions, please add them to the notes and trying to capture it the best I can, but uh, please uh, add there as well. So our next question um, is a little bit broader than the Digicon, but perhaps we can kind of weave it into the Digicon as well. Um, and it kind of links to um, that deep dive question too about how sessions might go to that next level. Um, I'm wondering, so the question is, what strategies have you found to be successful in gaining buy-in from leadership and making UDL an institutional priority? So, um, that could be sessions from the Digicon, perhaps, your experiences at your institutions with getting buy-in for doing this type of work. I know, too, a lot of um, institutions had kind of mass attendance, which is so cool. So any strategies that a panelist can share about gaining that buy-in um, for UDL projects like this or, um, or creating an institutional priority. And over to the panelists. 
I think I saw a tumbleweed passing by, so I'll jump in there. Well, um, it, this, it's, this is an ongoing work for me here at UT, and I, I know it is at a lot of places. That's University of Tennessee, not to be confused with our Texas brethren. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it, it, to me, it's really about starting with, with grassroots effort and getting getting some faculty by and people who, who already see the need for this and then using them to um, to produce data, to, to write write a, a research paper or demonstrate how the students are responding um, to the, the impact of the UDI implementation through design and delivery, the satisfaction that not only the students but the faculty feel um, with the teaching and learning experience as a result of that. And as we're collecting that data and then when possible, we're releasing it to department chairs to deans and my, my vision is to eventually have a small army that can go to the provost and say we need some attention here um, because what we're doing is working and we, we're going to need buyout we're going to need time we're going to need supports um, to begin to make this more institutional uh, it, so it, it is it is to me starting small as you need to um, you know I, I'm, I'm not a small focused person. I like seeing the big picture, but I have to recognize that it's necessary to start small and to leverage that as, as we scale up. And, and But I think often administrators speak a different language than faculty or staff. They're more interested, honestly, in, in retention, graduation rates, avoiding lawsuits, those types of things. And if you can demonstrate that what we're doing will help accomplish their goals, but also improve our student and faculty experience, then I think we begin to see progress. Hmm. Perhaps that could be a, a stream for next year, like kind of a deep dive stream um, of buy-in or institutional change, and that might lead into the, the key data points to you, which is kind of part of the next question. Could I jump in here, um, being probably the only administrator <laughs> in, the, in the link here? Um, you know, I'm an assistant provost at, at a, you know, a medium, a small medium college, whatever you want to put it. And the reality is, is that if I had uh, three faculty come to me with an idea that they wanted to implement UDL, I would, I would break down doors to find them support. Um, and, but getting them to th that point is hard. So I've been pushing UDL from the top down. And uh, you know, that has its own set of, of problems and uh, challenges, which is very interesting to navigate. You know, so it's... Uh, it's being able to, from my point of view, you know, get some buy-in from the faculty um, that want to do it. And uh, one of the, the neatest things that happened to me this last year is uh, we have a brand new doctoral program in occupational therapy. And one of the, uh, the candidates for the, the doctoral degree uh, wanted to uh, investigate the effect of UDL um, in the delivery of occupational therapy uh, courses. And so she was teaching an AS level degree course. And, um, you know, she did the full study with IRB approval and everything like that and implemented UDL um, into her class and studied her implementation of UDL, which was interesting. But uh, the reality is when it came down to it, you know, how do you filter out, um, you know, her her uh, newness in UDL as part of that whole process. So, you know, she's studying herself to a certain extent without being able to, you know, um, filter that out of the equation. So it's, it's, I think, like you're saying, Eric, that we really, as administrators, we want faculty to come push um, the, the whole idea and to, to really make the argument for that support. And, um, the more research that can be done on it, the more, you know, uh, more proof that you can provide that this is working, the better that would be for the administrators. I'll be quiet now. I wonder, Tom, um, do you get student um, feedback or student, did she get student feedback or surveys? Because sometimes yes. that can be so powerful where, you know, a student who says, I've been failing for 12 years from high school, you know, yeah. and, and well, then, you know, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She, part of her study was actually she she uh, she interviewed them via surveys three times uh, during the quarter, and then again at the very end of the course. And um, the the comments from these surveys were pretty um, pretty educational because in the beginning 
the students who had never had any UDL experience at all or any, I'll say, even non-traditional uh, education were really complaining about the fact that she wasn't doing PowerPoints. Uh, and they were saying, well, where are the PowerPoints? And at the end of the, in the final surveys, they're saying, you know, I really uh, grew to appreciate the fact that there wasn't so many PowerPoints and that they had so much flexibility. Um, you know, so we didn't get any, you know, global education comments from anybody, but the, uh, you know, that just that little transition, I think, really made a big enough difference to make it mean really something for that particular uh, faculty member. So and I saw her, yeah. Did she have pre-cert, like I wonder what, it, what her survey would have been like this semester before even too, you know, that idea. Correct, that yeah. Want. Now she compared her grades from uh, her UDL course to her previous version and there was no real difference. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a, a difference in the education uh, from that point of view. Because um, she probably spent the first six weeks of the 10 week term um, getting people used to this new delivery system where they were in charge more than she was. So um, it's, it's interesting. It is for sure. And um, that kind of leads in nicely to our, um, our final pre-asked pre question, uh, which is about data points. And you can refer to this, Tom, some of the things that would be useful from an administrator's perspective to help inform that decision-making and support for UDL. Uh, so the question here is, what are some of the key data points used to argue for a UDL effort, especially when there's so many initiatives and services claim to address completion and success rates? So I'm going to throw that in the chat here. And again, we'll start off with the panelists. If anyone wants to jump in on that one with our six minutes left and uh, with any key takeaways that respond to that question the key data points used to argue for a UDL effort. I'll share one just real briefly um, here at Virginia Tech. So I'm within the division of IT in a unit that focuses on teaching and learning. And I found that by not talking about UDL, it's actually better if I connect it to accessibility and 508 or 504 compliancy. And so it's not something that's new, it's just something that we need to do that's the right thing to do. And then once I get the buy-in, then we look at it, oh yeah, this helps support the UDL framework, or this is the technology that can help support the UDL framework. Um, a specific example of that is uh, we're implementing um, Blackboard Ally um, on our university here um, in a pilot that's about 4,000 students and multiple professors and, and faculty. and. The goal was to identify from an institution level the quantity of inaccessible, accessible educational materials that we have inside of our LMS, inside of Canvas. And we had no way of obtaining this data prior to implementing this tool. I could now take this data and go specifically to CIO and system provost and say, hey, look, of the, you know, 60,000 or 100,000 uh, PDFs that we have in our uh, LMS environment, here's the percentage, which was ridiculously high, I'm not going to share, but of inaccessible PDFs, and we don't have an appropriate remediation strategy or a plan in place to rectify this type of content. Oh, and oh, by the way, this feeds into creating an accessible learning environment such as UDL and taking it from that standpoint. So I never start with UDL, I always start with accessibility and then we connect it into UDL once I have that buy-in. Well, I, I'd also add to that, um, Equality Matters uses UDL and their standards, and that's been very helpful to say, look, here's some, not only some data, but some research. Um, so we find that very helpful. Uh, we have, we use Quality Matters quite a bit. It's in our template when we build our courses. And so it's easy for me to relate and show people how UDL is right incorporated right in with the QM. So that's how I kind of get it through the back door. Yeah, to address, um, I noticed Allison put a comment in the chat box about ensuring that UDL is not done for UDL itself, but it's implemented to address a problem of practice or need for change. Um, Eric and I are co-investigators for a research study right now um, at UT where we're working with six different faculty in six different colleges here um, who are intentionally implementing UDL and then we're taking already validated measures of student perceptions of immediacy 
and affective learning because those things are connected to retention um, to try to connect UDL to increases in student perceptions of immediacy and affective learning. So we'll see, we're hoping that the data shows that, um, but, but we're doing it this semester and next. And that's, I, I mean, I share that, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, if that will be what um, helps get the administration a little bit more open to these conversations. We, we have a lot of grassroots support from faculty and some UDL learning communities that are sponsored by CAST. I mean, um, I'm sorry, by College Star. I also love cast, so the C's. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, we're trying some we're we're trying some some research to see if we can show that UDL is increasing uh, some of those student perceptions, and that that would in turn increase retention within a major, within a discipline, within the school at large, uh, especially among some of our historically underrepresented groups. So that's one avenue. Mm -hmm. Another one that I was just thinking about that I'd love to get feedback on at a later point, so I'm just going to throw this out there, and if folks want to talk about it later, we can, is our enrollment management. U UT Austin is late to the game with a one-stop shop, um, but a lot of college campuses have those where the students can go to one location to find out about financial aid, as, uh, services for students with disabilities, tuition and billing, all the things, instead of having to go to all the different places all over campus. Um, and that by itself is kind of a, a UDL um, inspired idea, right? Because uh, it's providing all those things in one space and allowing students multiple ways to access and communicate and interface with those groups. And I just had a meeting this morning with someone from that group and they're collecting all this data about who chooses to engage via phone, who chooses to engage via the website, who comes in face to face, who uses the chat bot. And then what are their questions when they're coming in? And did those questions get resolved? And are they still seeing um, holes that students are experiencing in other avenues under student affairs that this in, um, one stop shop is not addressing? And they have all this data. And the woman that was talking to me today was like, we just don't know what to do with it yet. And I was like, oh, well, we could um, you know, turn it into a visualization. And maybe, maybe that's another avenue is for some of the pre-existing structures where they are gathering data trying to come in and help make sense of that data in a way that kind of comes back around and helps people think about what other ways could we um, engage students, what other ways could we allow students opportunities to engage with us, et cetera. So I'm not sure if other institutions have already played around with helping their one-stop shop um, as a site for that's kind of ripe for UDL growth, but that was just something that this morning kind of materialized. So. If you have experience with that, please send me an email, chat with me. What an awesome example too of kind of a, a relatively, don't like data's already there, we're just gonna help you make sense of it. A uh, way to get started, right? Um, and build some of those partnerships on campus too. That's awesome, Andrea. All right, well. Can, can I highlight a couple questions in the chat that we don't have time for right now, yeah. but just, mm -hmm. just so that they don't get lost. Yeah. Um, so Edna was asking about um, validated tools. So if anybody has some validated tools that they can pass on, there's there's a place for resources to share down below. Um, please feel free to, to put some stuff in there. Um, and then there was also a question for Mark that you might want to follow up with Drew um, in the chat there about how do we, as we start with accessibility, how do we avoid losing UDL as we just focus on accessibility or convolute the two? Mm -hmm. Awesome, great questions. And I'll add those to um, the collaborative note too, so we don't lose them when the Zoom closes. And perhaps some of those questions um, could launch another, um, uh, be a theme from one of these discussions too. So I think both of those are rich enough to uh, kind of take the time with uh, during an hour. And so if anyone too is interested in um, kind of hosting one of those topics, you're more than welcome to as well. Um, there's just so many um, fabulous topics to, to delve into. So for today, uh, we're going to kind of close this, this session and with a big thanks to our panelists for not only their work today, but their work with putting together such an awesome inaugural DigiCon and the first of many to come. Like, it's gonna be exciting to see how this evolves. So um, thank you very, very much. Uh, Next time, our next meeting, just to remember, is on February 25th, 2020. And Jess Patterson from George Brown College in Toronto, Ontario, 
is uh, going to lead a session about creative arts and problem solving around UDL. So I'm so pumped for that. I think it's going to be great. I'm not sure if Jess is on the call today, but Jess, thank you. We're looking forward to, to that session. All right, so we'll say uh, goodbye for now and, and thanks again. If anyone has any closing goodbyes, you can say them as people are going to the next meeting. <laughs> Take care.